Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AllowyTutors.com and in this video we're going to be looking at an introduction to transition metals. Now transition metals are the group of elements that are in the middle of the periodic table. Uh, they are, as the name suggests, metals, so they have giant metallic structure, they have high melting points uh, and they can conduct electricity and are good conductors of heat as well. Uh, because of their high melting points as well, some of the metals can be useful for uh, scenarios where you need a large amount of heat. So that could be in furnaces and jet engines. You could use titanium, for example, uh, and they also have some strength as well. So, for example, you can use iron to make steel, and that can be used to make um, uh, frameworks for buildings and houses. So they're really, really useful. Uh, we're also going to look at electron configuration uh, of the elements and the ions that they form. We're going to look at their chemical properties, and we're also going to look at some uh, definitions of a transition metal and a D-block element, because it is important that we need to know the difference between them. And that's where I'm going to start. So up on the right-hand side there, we can see we've got um, the difference between a D-block element and a transition element. And you've got to know the difference between these two. Essentially, a transition element is uh, defined as something that will, in, its, in a stable iron, that forms a stable iron, that will have a partially filled D subshell. And that's really important. And the ion bit is important as well. We're not talking about the elemental version of the transition metal that has a partially filled D subshell. It's the iron, a stable iron, that, that transition metal can form. And if that stable iron has a partially filled D subshell, then it will be classed as a transition metal. And this is different to what we call a D block element, where this is any element that would have its outermost electrons, in other words, the highest energy level, uh, that occupy D block or occupy a D orbital. And so uh, we can come up with these two different types of elements. So we have scandium and zinc. And scandium and zinc are classed as not transition metals. They are either side of the top row of the transition metal block. Um, and scandium, for example, its stable iron is SC3+. Now, if we take three electrons away from a scandium atom, we're left with an ion that has an electron configuration with no electrons in the d orbital. So because that is not partially filled, we say that scandium is not a transition element. And that's really important that you've got to know the difference between the two, as it's quite a common question for them to ask in the exam. Okay, if we come on to electron configurations, uh, now, electron configurations of elemental uh, transition metals. They always have electrons in the 4s orbital, um, and some of them are, fill, are full, so they have two electrons in there, and some of them are not, which we'll come on to in a minute as well. There is some exceptions. But uh, I'm just going to go through and show you how we can fill these up uh, and show you what the electron configuration is as well. Now, these things, um, I've drawn the 4s and 3d in the same row, so there's no energy difference here. But the 4s and 3d orbitals are actually really close together in terms of energy. Uh, and that's why we've got the word transition there as well, because the electrons can move uh, relatively easily between the 4s and the 3d orbitals. And these orbitals can change in terms of energy uh, energy levels as well. So we're going to start with the, um, uh, the first element in the transition, uh, well, in the d block, should I say, which is scandium. Now, scandium has two electrons in the 4s orbital. So I'll draw them there. Um, and it also has one electron in the 3D orbital. Remember, we're talking about elements here, so we're not talking about the ionic version. If we go next along to titanium, titanium would have one electron in the next orbital. Uh, remember, we can't put the electron in the same orbital because of electron repulsion, so they sit in the separate orbital. Uh, if we come on to the next one, which is titanium, uh, sorry, vanadium. So vanadium has got three electrons in there. Uh, and then if we come to uh, chromium, now this is where it gets a little bit different. You can see here with chromium, we've got four electrons here. However, uh, what happens is to get a full, uh, to get half filled D subshell is actually quite stable. And what chromium does, or the electron configuration of chromium, is this electron in the 4s orbital can actually occupy this spare orbital in the D uh, the spare orbital in the D subshell. So what we have effectively for chromium, and you've got to be really careful for this, is actually we have um, the configuration for argon, which is here, uh, and we have 4s1, which we'll put there, and we have 3d5. And it's important to know that 
that chromium is one of these ones a little bit strange, a little bit different. Uh, and the reason why it does this is because this uh, configuration, having a half-filled 3D subshell, is a lot more stable than not having that. Okay, if we go to the next element, which is manganese. Now, manganese will fill up this electron here first. Uh, so remember, S orbitals will fill up first. So manganese has that configuration. Uh, the next one along is iron, and iron would then start and fill up the D, uh, the D electron. Uh, the next one after that is cobalt, and again, cobalt would have that configuration. Uh, the next one along is nickel. Nickel will have this configuration here. Uh, and the next one along would be copper. Now, copper does a very similar thing to uh, what chromium did. It's one of these bizarre ones. So we'll add the extra electron for copper there. But again, to form a full D subshell is more stable than leaving it like this. So the electron from the 4S orbital here will then move into this orbital. And now we have a full 3D subshell, which is more stable than the configuration that we had before. So for copper, the configuration is the configuration for argon, and it'll be 4s1, and then 3d10. So you can see that we have a 4s1, and these are the only two elements in the transition metal block in that first row that actually have one electron in the s orbital when they're an element. And if we come on to the last one, uh, the last one there was zinc. Uh, that's the last element after copper. Obviously, the electron for zinc will go into that S orbital, and then it's full. And after this, we then go into the P block, uh, which would be gallium, which would be next after that. So that's effectively how we fill them out. But you do have to watch out for chromium and copper, as these do have this different uh, electron configuration to the standard one. All the other elements have two electrons in the 4S orbital. Okay, if we just come into the uh, one down here, these are ions. So it's very common for transition metals to lose electrons as well. Uh, it gives them this difference in oxidation state, which we'll come on to in a minute for the properties. But uh, we remove electrons from the S orbital first. Uh, and that's because the S orbital is actually slightly higher in energy than the D orbital when we're removing electrons. So uh, we remove it from there first because it's easier to remove. So if we look at this, for example, we've got uh, manganese as an element here. The uh, atomic or the uh, elemental manganese is 3D is the configuration for argon, 3D5. 4s2. Manganese, though, can come in one of its stable ions as Mn2+, uh, and we effectively we remove the 4s electrons first before the 3d. Um, and so effectively we only need to remove two electrons because it's Mn2+. They get removed from the 4s first, uh, and effectively what we're left with is 3d5. Once you've removed the electrons from the 4s, if you have, for, say, for example, a 3 plus ion, uh, for example, iron, so Fe3+, plus, you would remove the electrons from the S orbital first, then you'd remove an electron from the D orbital. But it is really important, you always remove electrons from the S orbital first before the D orbital. That's really crucial. Okay, just coming on to the last bit, just looking at some chemical properties of transition metals. They all have certain things in common. They're really useful in industry in particular uh, for things like catalysts and paints, etc., so one of the features of a transition metal is color. Now, for example, um, we can give an example for color, and we'll do this one in blue. Uh, for example, you might have um, iron. So we'll put that, Fe2+. Plus. Uh, for example, we'd have a uh, green color. Uh, Fe3 plus might be a red, like a reddish orange color, etc. So a lot of these um, uh, transition metals are colorful metals, so it's really nice to look at. Uh, catalysts, they're really good catalysts. For example, we can use um, iron as a catalyst in the Haber process in the manufacture of ammonia. So um, we'll put that in there. Uh, put Haber process. There we go. Uh, and you, there are loads of other catalysts as well, um, but that's just one example. Uh, variable oxidation states. Again, the word transition means they can vary the oxidation states, and that makes them useful as um, uh, makes them useful for potential reducing and oxidizing agents as well. So, for example, you could have uh, Fe2 plus, uh, and you can have Fe3 plus. So, uh, there's just one example of a transition metal that has a different same element, so same number of protons. Um, but it's got a different oxidation state. It's got a different number of electrons in the outer shell. 
And the last one is complex formation. Now, complexes are a transition metal, is a, basically is a large molecule with a transition metal in the middle, and we have ligands that surround it, and they're datably covalently bonded or coordinately bonded to the metal ion in the middle. And transition metals have this uh, very unique ability to uh, form large complexes. Um, so, for example, you might take, um, we'll pick um, copper, so Cu2+. Plus. Uh, and, for example, copper, if you dissolve that in water, um, so we'll put H2O, then what it can form is copper and then H2O. Uh, and because these are uh, complexes, they have a lot of water around them. And if it's a water ligand, then you would have six of them surrounding that as well. And um, there are videos that look into complex formation as well. So we just uh, click on the playlist to do with aqueous transition metal complexes. Uh, then uh, you can have a look at that video there as well. But just for time being, I just want to explain that they can form complexes. So obviously we'll put a six there to balance that. Uh, and this whole complex has a charge of two plus. So that's it. You do need to know, just in summary, you need to know the definition between a transition metal and a D block element. You also need to know the electron configurations and watch out for chromium and copper uh, and chemical properties as well. But that's it. Hope that helps. Bye.